All right, we're live on a Wednesday night for the Panther Lair Show. It's 8.30, it's August 3rd, Wednesday. I'm Chris Peake from PantherLair.com, and we are here for an hour of pit sports talk. You know the website, I think, I hope you do, PantherLair.com, Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, recruiting, cover it all, PantherLair.com. There's a dog barking in the background. I presume you can hear that because some terrible thing must be happening outside. Dogs, uh, outside. <laughs> this is, uh, this is how you know it's live, folks. This is how you know it's real because if, if it wasn't live, if I was taping this, I would just stop recording and start over when there are not rabbit animals going crazy upstairs, but... Since this is live, we get some of the uh, fun of, uh, you know, ambient noise, right? Found found noise. But anyway, <laughs> let's try and get this back on track. Every Wednesday night, we're here at 8.30 for an hour of all pit sports talk on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. Like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Those are the two big things you can do to help support the podcast, get the word out about what we're doing here. You know, we do a lot, we try to do a lot of stuff on our YouTube channel. Whether it's Monday morning, we have the weekend recap, get you up to speed on everything that's going on in the world of pit sports, everything you need to know, um, you know, from the weekend, uh, everything that you need to know for the week. We do that every Monday morning. So, you you know, that video is always going to come out. That That's not a live video. That's just a video we release. And you can always look forward to that. We have this show on Wednesday nights. And then throughout training camp, we're going to have more and more video content from Pitt training camp as the Panthers head toward the 2022 season. So you need to be subscribed to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. You do that, and then you're always going to know when we post a new video. You don't have to worry about missing out on a live stream, missing out on a new video release. You don't have to worry about those things because you're going to get the notification. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. And then, of course, like this video. That's huge for us as well. And I always like to say that these Wednesday night shows, I, I kind of look at them like a talk show. I know I do a lot of talking on my own. Somebody on Twitter told me today I'm too verbose that I, uh, I, I talk for the sake of talking or I like to hear myself speak or something like that, which I can assure you is not the case. Um, the, the liking to hear yourself speak part, at least. Uh, But I always, I always say I do look at this as like a talk show where I talk for a little while, um, kind of throw some topics out, kind of break down whatever news there is that needs to be broken down. And then you guys get in there with your comments and your questions and we can have a little conversation and back and forth and discussion. That's the fun of it. You go in that chat screen right there during the during the live stream, post your comment or your question and, and we'll get to it and we'll discuss it now. Sometimes we don't get to everybody's comment. We don't answer everybody's question. If you want to make sure your comment gets you know, read and responded to, if you want to make sure that your question gets answered, you can be a super chatter. So you hit that little dollar sign down at the bottom of the screen. You can give, um, you know, contribute a few bucks to the podcast, help us out, support us for what we're doing here. And um, we will definitely make sure we get to your comment and your question that goes with your your super chat uh, contribution. So we appreciate all the super chatters who roll in every week. Um, big ups to you guys. It's uh, it, it's nice. Uh, it's a nice acknowledgement that you enjoy what we're doing here. I know I have fun doing this uh, doing this show every Wednesday night. I hope you enjoy it as well. So training camp started this week. It opened on Monday. They had their first practice of camp on Monday. Pat Narduzzi's first press conference of the season, really. Um, or at least first press conference of camp was on Monday. Media day was on Monday. We got to talk to a bunch of players and coaches after the practice. And, and it, you know, a little, not quite the traditional setting for those sort of interviews. You know, typically after a practice, they'll bring one player at a time. We'll all stand around that player and ask them questions and everybody gets the answers. Everybody records it and, you know, gets the same answers and all those kinds of things. Um, it's a little different on media day because we uh, they they put a half dozen or eight or ten players in a room 
and we just go in and, and we can interview any of them and ask any questions we want. And so Jim Hammond and I have done this for a few years now. We've developed survey questions and, you know, we ask all the offensive guys who's stepping up as a leader on offense, who's stepping up as a leader on defense, who are some young players or some newcomers to keep an eye on guys that have impressed you so far. What do you think about the backyard brawl? How excited are you for that? What's it like in college sports in the world of NIL? We, we cover a lot of those things and hopefully you got a chance to check those articles out. Um, that we ran, for the most part, on uh, I think one or two on Monday, a bunch on Tuesday, one or two on Wednesday. Hopefully you had a chance to look at those because um, there was some really interesting stuff in there. And we'll talk about a few of those topics throughout, uh, you know, probably tonight. You know, I'm sure we'll, I mean, some of the topics we're going to keep talking about uh, because they're, they're relevant topics. But I think, you know, some of the answers are certainly worth considering. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit throughout the show but I mean the big storylines on Monday coming out of media day at coming out of the start of training camp they were the same storylines we've been talking about all spring you know what I mean or all all, all off season I should say um, you know whether it was in the immediate aftermath of the Peach Bowl whether it was throughout the course of spring camp or whether it's been over the course of the summer I mean we've pretty much been talking about the same topics Every day, you know what I mean? Uh, pretty consistently throughout um, all this time. It's the quarterback competition. It's the returning strength on the offensive line. It's the Jordan Addison transfer, both how that came about, what it means for Pitt, how they're going to replace his production. Um, it's the strengths of the defensive line, you know, and the secondary. It's replacing the two outside linebackers. It's how do you follow up on an ACC championship? Everything we talked about. Everything we have talked about since January 1st, basically. Um, you know, the Jordan Addison topic probably wasn't one on January 1st. That didn't become a topic until May 1st or whatever it was. But everything we talked about since the end of the Peach Bowl was brought up on Media Day because those are still the main topics. There's no surprises here. And, and I think that was probably one of the big impressions that came away from Media Day with is... You know, and the first day of camp, and and now they had their their second open practice on on Wednesday. And by open practice, I mean media got to watch thirty minutes or so. First thirty minutes of practice, um, but one of the things that came away from those two days thinking, one of the one of the the thoughts that I really had is that at this point, I, I think we know who this team is. I think we know where their strengths are. I think we know where they have holes to fill. I think we know what the X factors are that can turn this into, you know, I, I keep using the phrase either a return to Charlotte or a return to eight wins. Um, we know what's at stake for this team. We know what this team is working for. We know what this team accomplished last season and what they're going to need to do to accomplish that again or surpass those accomplishments this season. There's not a lot of surprises. No, there will be players who break out. There will be players who are surprises, who, who contribute a lot more this season than we expect them to. I think John Patrician was a guy who contributed more last season than I expected him to, coming, you know, at least at the start of training camp. And I think there'll be guys this year who fit into that category as well. I mean, we've talked about the corners who are going to replace Damari Mathis. You know what I mean? We've talked about MJ Devonshire and AJ Woods. Um, but what about a guy like Rashad Battle? What about a guy like a Javante Royal? What about Rylan Gandy, whose name keeps getting brought up as a freshman who enrolled in January um, and uh, you know was here through spring camp? You know, will there be a guy like that who emerges? Probably. You know, same way with the outside linebackers. I mean, we talked about Bengali Kamara and Solomon DeShields to no end. You know, what I mean, I've talked about those guys a ton. But what about a Tyler Wiltz? Is Tyler Wiltz transfer from Missouri State, super productive linebacker there? At the FCS level, is he? how is he going to make that transition to the Power 5 level? And if he transitions well, could he be sort of a surprise player? And so, I mean, some possibilities exist like that. I think you can find a few examples at tight end. Maybe receiver, if you want to start talking about like uh, Jaden Bradley, maybe making some big contributions. I mean, I think we all have pretty high-level expectations for Kanate Mumfield, for Jared Wayne. I think the expectations have grown for uh, Bub Means. But I think, you know, maybe a guy like Jaden Bradley could break out and be a surprise, or a Miles Alston or somebody like that, or a freshman like Addison Copeland or Che Wabuko. 
but on the whole, so I mean, you you know where there are a few spots where a guy could potentially break out, but on the whole, I don't think there are a lot of surprises lurking on this team. I think we pretty much know what the storylines are. I think we pretty much know where the strengths and weaknesses are. I think we know what question marks exist, and I think we know what needs to be done to answer those questions. This team, it's the best way to say this, this team is who we think they are. And I, I mean, I think there are probably some varying opinions on it, but for the most part, I feel like we know who this team is. We know they should be very good. We know they should compete for and or win the ACC Coastal Division. We know they should compete for and or win the ACC. And we know that if everything goes right, they should have a shot at the college football playoffs. And I, and I don't think, you know, Media Day, I didn't need Media Day to reassure me of these things. These are the things that we've all been thinking, again, throughout the offseason. But I think, like I said, what I came out of Media Day thinking is, you know, it, it was possible that I, I could have come out of Media Day and then a whole new storyline would have developed. You know what I mean? Like the co- some of the coaches might have said this or that. Pat Narduzzi might have said this or that. Or a line of questioning might have come up that, that opened up some new doors. Wow, I never really thought about that. Hey, they're a lot thinner at that position than I thought. Hey, they're deeper here. Or hey, that actually is kind of a problem or this, anything. But it didn't happen. They are who we think they are. And, and those expectations are set high based on who they are. There's no mystery with this team, I guess is, is what I would say. I, I mean, there are some uncertainties. There are some areas where you don't know how the quarterback's going to play. You don't know how the outside linebackers are going to play. But there are no mysteries about this team. They have a goal, several goals. They have the players and the, the personnel and the roster and the staff, I think, to accomplish a fair amount of their goals. And it's, it's always, like I've said, all offseason, it's going to come back to the quarterback and how well the quarterback plays and, and what kind of performance you get out of Keaton Slovis. But there's not a lot of mystery here. They're either going to do it, they're either going to achieve um, at the level they're capable of achieving, or they're, they're going to fall short and disappoint. And I know you could probably say that on any given year. Well, the team's either going to live up to expectations or they're going to disappoint. But I think it's unique this year because the expectations are so high. Because the ceiling for this team is so high. Because they really can be one of those outlier teams that that at least knock on the door if don't out and out kick it down. And they control their destiny. You know, they, they really do control their destiny. They're not going to be relying on anybody else to beat Miami. They're not going to be relying on anybody else um, to help them improve their resume. They've got all the built-in advantages to not only, you know, get to the Coastal, you know, win the Coastal and get to the ACC Championship game, but they have the built-in advantages, or they have a schedule that's built in with opportunities to build a resume that's going to help you when you get to the, if you, you know, when you get to the end of the season if you've taken care of business. You know, and specifically, I'm talking about those two opening games. You know, with West Virginia and Tennessee, Your two Power Five non-conference opponents gives you a great opportunity to announce to everyone that you're you're going to be pretty good. And we've talked about where they're going to open the AP preseason poll. My guess is somewhere between 15 and 20. We talked about the opportunities that exist with those first two games of where that could bump them into the top 15, maybe into the top 12, depending on how they look in those games, and what else happens around the world of college football in those first two weeks. But there's a real possibility that this team is on the doorstep of, if not totally in, the top 10 when they get to ACC play in October. And I like the schedule setup that they had last year, and I like the way that it's it's here again, where you've got your four non-conference games on the four weekends in, in September, and then from there on out, it is just straight to the dome ACC games it's just all conference games no distractions no breaks no slip-ups no Delaware game in the you know fifth game fifth week of the season or anything like that you play your four non-conference games and you get down to business and that's what they did last year and they obviously took care of business and it's what they have an opportunity to do this year to take care of business again and head into the ACC maybe this year with uh, that perfect non-conference record it's not gonna be easy like West Virginia is going to give them a fight, you know, and I think it's going to be a sloppy game. I've said that a few times, um, where the wrong mistake could cost you the game. 
Uh, and, and I think week two is, I mean, whatever kinks you have to iron out, whatever little issues you need to figure out, it, it, whenever you're going to make your mistakes or your errors, you better have them all put together by week two because you're going to have to be ready. And you're going to have to be sharp, and you're going to have to go out and play a really good game, I think, to beat Tennessee. So that's going to be a, a, a real challenge. But if you get through that, you survive at Western Michigan, close out against whatever, Rhode Island, you got a chance to hit the ground running when you go into conference play. But these are all the storylines we've talked about for eight months, right? These are all the things we've talked about since the end of the Peach Bowl. It's what we talked about throughout January and February. It's what we talked about throughout spring camp. It's what we talked about when we weren't talking recruiting in June and July. Same storylines. No mystery. This is who Pitt is in 2022. This is what they have an opportunity to do. This is how well positioned they seem to be, uh, you know, as in in having a chance of accomplishing it. All right, let's get to uh, some comments and questions. See what uh, people are talking about tonight. Lots of comments and questions already in there. We appreciate it. Uh, TRR says, looking at the camp photos on the lair, who's number 80? A walk-on. Yeah, number 80 showed up. He's not on the um, online roster. We got a paper roster, though. We had a number 80, a wide receiver. Isaiah Nesmith is his name. He's a true freshman from American Heritage High School um, in West Palm Beach, Florida. As far as I know, he's a walk-on. I'm going to double-check that. Um this week, uh, he wasn't on the roster. He's not on Pitt's online roster. At least he wasn't the last time I looked earlier um, in the day on Wednesday. But Isaiah Nesmith, 6'3", 185. He wears number 80, a wide receiver. And uh, he, I mean, he certainly looks big. In the photos we got from practice, Matt Hawley got a photo of him on Monday and a photo again on Wednesday. We'll actually see him. He'll, he'll pop up in the, the slideshow here as we... As we go through on the live stream, I'll, I'll point him out if I uh, if I happen to notice him scrolling through. But, oh, there he is. Perfect timing, right? Number 80. Look, looks like a big kid, right? Looks like he might be one of the bigger receivers on the team. Um, I think, you know, Bub Means is a pretty big receiver. I think Jaden Bradley definitely has size. Jared Wayne is pretty, pretty tall. Jaden Bradley might be the tallest. I'm not sure. I'd have to see all those guys lined up next to each other. Uh, but number 80, Isaiah Nesmith. Interesting guy, seems like. As a, a true freshman, um, presumably walk on from from Florida. I'm actually gonna. I meant to look up his rival's profile. Yeah, unrated, unrated coming out of um, American Heritage High School. No offers that we list. Apparently, took a look at Rutgers. Oh, you know what? That's right. I remember Isaiah Nesmith uh, was going to Rutgers as a uh, a walk on, and uh, had a connection with Taekwon Underwood. That's why. And then Underwood came to Pitt, and um, that's right. Nesmith decided to follow him, coming to Pitt as a uh, as a as a walk on. That's who he is. So he has that connection with Isaiah Nesmith, big receiver. Um, was going to walk on at Rutgers, but is walking on at Pitt now. I forgot about that. Good, uh, good point, TRR. I'm glad you made me look that up and, and get the details on that. We'll, we'll have to do, you know, training camp goes five weeks, four weeks, something like that. You, you hit a certain spot where you start writing about walk-ons and things like that. It will hit that spot, and uh, Nesmith will be one of those guys we'll, we'll ask about and talk about. Uh, Anthony Tennyson says, what's up, Chris? I'm ready for some old-fashioned pit football talk. Let's go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that time of year. And, and, I mean, look, we've talked football for 12 months a year. I mean, that's what we do. But, certainly, it's getting uh, it's getting rolling right now. Uh, Doug Woods says, is Bub Means cleared for week one? Yeah, Bub Means is eligible. He's available to play. He's going to be on the field, and I think he's going to make a big contribution. I, I named – I wrote about this in the 3-2-1 column on Friday. Three things we know, two questions, one prediction. And then I talked about it again in the week on re, weekend recap on Monday morning. On the video, I talked about five players that I'm. I said I'm irrationally high on. This is what I, irrationally high on. I'm, I'm really high on their potential for this season. I think they're going to be really good players. I think they're they are stars in the making. I think they have a chance to uh, uh, make you know huge plays and big impact and all this kind of thing. Breakout seasons, but I'm not really basing that on much in the way of tangible evidence. It's just sort of a gut feeling. I'm I'm irrationally high on these guys. 
And I mentioned, you know, Solomon DeShields and Bengali Kamara. You shouldn't be surprised by those two if you've listened to this podcast in the past. I mentioned Israel Banakanda, who obviously was the team's leading rusher last year, but I think he is I think he can double his yardage in 2022, which is a bit of an irrationally high prediction. Uh, but again, if you've listened to this podcast, you know where I stand with Izzy. I, I think Izzy is the man. I think he's an NFL running back. I think he's going to have a huge 2022 and go to the NFL next year. But I digress. Um, who's the other one? So it was DeShields, Kamara, Abana Kanda, Dayon Hayes. Um, who I, I, I think has shown flashes of what he can do. I think he is poised for a huge breakout year this year. And then the other one I mentioned was Bub Means. And Bub Means, you know, it's partially kind of looking at what he did at Louisiana Tech, looking at some of the film, looking at some of the numbers, and, and not just the receptions and yardage, but looking at usage and the average depth of target and how they, how they used him and what his role was at Louisiana Tech. And I looked at all. I'm looking. I've been looking at all those things, and then talking to people, talking to people who have watched practice, you know, coaches, people around the program. You know, what's up with Bub? Can he really help you? And the resounding word coming back, like 100% uh, consensus, unanimous opinion, is that Bub Means is going to be a big time player for Pitt, big time player. Kanate Mumfield's still going to be your number one receiver. Jared Wayne is going to do what Jared Wayne does, which is very valuable. I'm a big fan of what Jared Wayne does. Um, but Bub Means is going to make a real impact. That's that's what I keep hearing. And so, somewhat irrational to be as high on him as I am, but based on just kind of what I'm hearing about how he's looked and how he's gone, you know, the potential that he has. So now you have Mumfield. You have Wayne, you have Means, um, you have Jaden Jaden Bradley, you have Jalen Barden. And that's a pretty good group to start with. You know what I mean? As, as you're, is that five guys? Mumfield, Wayne, Means, Bradley, Barden. Those five guys. If those five guys are your top five, I, I think, and, and they stay healthy. Uh, they all play up to their abilities and all that. I, I think you have a really good group there. And then, you know, you see what you get from mixing in Miles Olsen or Addison Copeland or Che Wabuko. I know Che is a, a fan favorite for his speed. You can't teach that kind of speed. Just get the ball in his hands and let him run. Uh, but it's slightly more complicated than that. Uh, maybe not a ton, but slightly. So, you know, you, you can't just put the ball in his hands and let him run. Um, I think Means is going to make a big impact, though. And yeah, to your answer to your question, Doug, he is going to be uh, available in week one. Um, let's see here. Roy Speakham says, listen closely. The dog may have a good comment. You know, my dogs hear me talk about pit football and basketball and recruiting enough. They, they don't have anything to say during the live stream. Royce is referencing uh, at the open of the... At the opening of the show, a dog was barking rather loudly, getting uh, crazy about things. So, yeah, I don't think he has anything to say about Pitt. Matt P says, I'm a faithfully loyal replay viewer, finally catching one live for the first time since the winter, I believe. I work midnights, so I'm always sleeping or I forget. Matt, we're glad to have you. It's always fun to have more viewers on the live stream with comments and questions. If you got something you want to say, love to uh, love to hear it. Um, Jeff Anderchak says, could Miles Alston, Addison Copeland, or Che Wabuko get on the field this year? They could. Um, a- anything is possible. I mean, you're, you're looking at five receivers right now, like I said. Kanate Mumfield, Jared Wayne, Bub Means, Jalen Barden, Jaden Bradley. Those are, your, those are your top five. Now, I don't think you're going to have 140 targets go to one guy like they did with Jordan Addison last year. One, I don't know that they have the kind of receiver who merits that target share two i don't know that frank signetti is necessarily the type of offensive coordinator who would call that kind of offense i mean this you know it wasn't just about jordan addison now i mean jordan addison made it easy to throw him the ball as many times as they did but that wasn't a unique product of having jordan addison that was how mark whipple does it i mean that was mark whipple's mo you go back and look at his years at umass um 
And I forget the one guy. He threw like he had like 160 targets every year. The receiver. It was like the tight end Adam Brenneman and uh, oh, what was the receiver's name at UMass? I forget. He, he went to the NFL. I think he's in the NFL. Um, but he just got like a billion targets, and and this is what Whipple did. And and Whipple got to Pitt, and he did it with Maurice French. In 2019, he did it with Jordan Addison in 2020, and he definitely did it with Jordan Addison this past season. That's how Whipple calls an offense. He emphasizes specific players for good reason. I mean, Jordan Addison is the one you want to throw the ball to as many times as you can, and it obviously worked out pretty well for Pitt to do so. Frank Signetti doesn't necessarily call it like that. Now, when he was here in 2009, yeah, Jonathan Baldwin got a ton of targets. Doran Dickerson got a ton of targets. They handed the ball off to Deion Lewis a ton of times. But he still spread it around more than Whipple tends to do. Or more than Whipple's tendency was. And so, I don't think you're going to see that 120 target player this year. I don't know if you're going to see a 100 target player this year. I think you're going to see maybe a slightly more even spread of targets. There's obviously going to be a guy who leads the team in targets. And it's probably going to be... By a significant amount. I think Kanate Mumfield is going to have a lot more targets than anybody else on the team. But I think the separation between Mumfield and Jared Wayne and Bub Means is going to be less than it, the separation was between Jordan Addison and Jared Wayne last year. So I, I think you'll see a more balanced spread of the targets rather than just peppering one guy as much as Mark Whipple had Kenny Pickett do last year um this is all a long way around of of answering your question about miles alston and addison copeland and and che wabuko i I think if you're top five guys i think if mumfield wayne um means bradley and barden if those guys stay healthy no i don't see a huge role for miles alston for addison copeland for che wabuko um just because those top five guys are experienced they're talented They've been productive. Well, you know, Bradley and Barton haven't done a ton. I think those guys got nine passes each last year. But they've been on the field a lot. You know, they've, they've played a decent amount of football in their college careers. Just like Kanate Mumfield, even though he only played one year at Akron. Just like Jared Wayne, who's now a senior. And just like Bob Means, who's been around for three or four years. Uh, you know, Alston, Copeland, Wabuko are going to take some time, are going to have to take some time getting used to the game. That's not to say that freshmen can't play at wide receiver. We've seen freshmen play at receiver. We've seen freshmen excel at receiver. Uh, Maurice, well, Maurice French didn't really do that much. He had a touchdown or two, but it wasn't uh, a huge freshman season in 2016. But obviously, Jordan Addison was really good as a freshman in 2020. Tyler Boyd was really good as a freshman in 2013. Um, Jonathan Baldwin had his moments in 2008. And obviously, Larry Fitzgerald in 2002 was... The only thing better than Larry Fitzgerald in 2002 was Larry Fitzgerald in 2003. So, you know, freshmen can excel at receiver. But I think there's enough talent, experience, and depth at the position that those three guys are probably going to need an injury to really fight their way into meaningful reps. Um, I I don't think they'll keep Che Wabuko on the bench all season. Uh, I think he'll get some snaps. and, And maybe he can make a few plays and forces his way into the rotation even in a you know a unique sort of specialized role, but I think the emphasis is still going to be on those five guys at the top, provided they all stay healthy. Let's see, we got a super chatter here. Why man uh, says, uh, or I'm sorry, Yinin. Uh, Apologize if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, says, hi, Chris. Weekly listener here, and I appreciate your work. Always been curious. How do you get introduced and connect with high school recruits? Great uh, interviews and scoops over the years. Um, that's a good question. So there's a lot of there's a lot of ways you go about it. The, the first thing I would say when it comes to us covering recruiting and, and sort of the process of covering recruiting, and I don't think you can overstate the importance of this, is being a part of the Rivals.com network. And that's not towing the company line. That's not uh, you know blowing smoke to talk about how great Rivals is. I think being part of a network is huge, huge. Uh, And I think the value is almost immeasurable because I can be out here, right? I can be out here sitting in the pantherlawyer.com offices 
scouring Twitter all day for new recruits that the coaches are following. Um, you know, new kids who tweet out offers about Pitt, and, and I can I can work it from that angle. All right, and, and look, there are many companies and 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 websites and publications in uh, all over the country who have built something based on that model of using Twitter pretty much as as your main entry point to covering recruiting. And and it's fine. You know, I, I said a long time ago. If you want to be a sports writer, if you're if you're a guy sitting around, and you say, "I just I want to be a sports writer." Well, recruiting is the way in. You know, if you're just random guy, and you email the Pirates and say, "Hey, I want to get into the clubhouse in the press room," probably not going to get it. You email the Steelers and say, hey, I, "I want to I'm 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 coming to Mike Tomlin's press conference on Tuesday. I'm going into the locker room for interviews on Wednesday. When does Ben talk?" You know, probably going to say, "Who are you?" You're not coming to cover the team. And and if you're not going to those things and participating in that way, you're not really covering the team. You know what I mean? I, there, that, that's, a, that's a whole digression I don't need to go down. Uh, there, there are new definitions and changing definitions of what it means to cover a team. Um, in the sort of professional journalist sense, being there and being around is part of it. Right, and you're not going to get credentialed to do those things to be around those teams if you're just random guy. But what you can do is create a Twitter account, follow all the recruits that the coaches follow, DM all the recruits who tweet out their offers, and get them for interviews. You, you, it, it, there's very low barrier to entry, and, and none of the like. Don't take any of this to be disparaging or derogatory or, or negative in any way. I, I'm, I'm just saying what it is. Okay, you can cover recruiting. You need a Twitter account, and that's it. You cover recruiting. That that's really all you need. Now, where we have an advantage, um, and, and again, this is not uh, saying this. I'm, I'm not saying this promotionally. I'm saying this as just sort of you. You asked a question of of how do we sort of get in contact with the recruits and find out about the recruits and and do the process of covering recruiting. Um, we're not just like, I'm not just one guy with a Twitter account. I am one guy with a Twitter account and a website and all that stuff, but I've also got 80, 90, a hundred other guys all over the country doing the same thing I'm doing. And there's times where I'm going to find out that a recruit is visiting Rutgers and I reach out to my guy, Richie, who runs the Rutgers rival site. Hey, hey man, better check on this dude. He's coming in. Or Richie hears about a guy who's come visiting Pitt. He reaches out. Hey, hey man, so-and-so from uh, Jersey City. He's coming out visiting this weekend. Okay, good. Now we got a little something. And we've got that all over. All over the country, we have people covering recruiting. And there's there's a lot of communication there and help and back and forth. We should, you know, contact info and, uh, hey, do you have a number for this guy? Yeah, here, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up here. I'll, you know, send him a text, this kind of thing. And so there's a lot of cooperation and collaborative work, which I think makes the rivals network strong, you know, and, and, and I think the strength of that network makes all the individual sites strong. You know, I think we really do benefit from being part of the rivals network. And so, you know, to your, your question of how do you get introduced to and connect with high school recruits? Um, it's, it's, you know, one, one thing is meeting them in person, going to camps and seeing them there and, you know, talking to them there and connecting with them there. And another is just being able to come up with the contact info because not every kid has open DMs, right? Not every kid has open DMs, but we might have, you know, somebody else in the Rivals Network might have a phone number for the kid. Well, I can try and send a text. Maybe this kid doesn't check his direct messages, you know? And if all you are is a guy with a Twitter account, and you're relying on Twitter as your way to connect with recruits, and a kid either doesn't have open direct messages or doesn't check his direct messages, well, it can be a little bit tough then. You know what I mean? And so we that that's, I think, an advantage for us. And, and that's a big part of how it happens. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot of work on the phone. It's a lot of relying on, uh, you know, other people who may have contact info or know a coach or know a trainer. I mean, there's, there's a big process I can't tell you the, the number of times that like, you know, I'll sit down and be like, all right, I got a list of 20 kids I'm going to try and get tonight. 
to either find out are they visiting, have they talked to the coaches recently, they got any plans for official visits, been to any games, all this kind of stuff. And, and it's just a process of sending text messages or direct messages or making calls. And out of those 20, I might get three who respond on any given night. And two of them say they don't talk to Pitt anymore. <laughs> and so at the end of the night, you got one guy who says, yeah, he's thinking about coming to a game next month. And that might be all you come up with. You know, and then the next night you work on 20 guys and you get 15 who say they all, uh, you know, are visiting next week and they love Pitt and they might commit. It, it's it's a wild uh, business and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. But this is a good question. Thanks for uh, asking that. Let's see what we got here. Jason Martell says, uh, more snaps this year, Elliot Donald or Nakai Johnson? I understand they play different positions. Yeah, I mean, it's not a, you're, you're obviously not making a comparison there between Johnson and Donald, but they're interesting guys as second-year players, highly touted four-star recruits who came in and redshirted last season, and I think there are high expectations for those guys. Now, Nakai Johnson is... Um, Nikai Johnson is behind Haba Baldonado, John Morgan, Deslin Alexander, and Dayon Hayes. That's tough. That's a tough one to crack. Uh, Elliot Donald is behind Kalaja Kansi, Tyler Bentley, David Green, and Dan- Devin Danielson. Now, I think it would be easier to crack into that rotation of defensive tackles than the rotation of defensive ends. I think the defensive tackles, you've got Kalijah Kansi, who's super productive, is a playmaking defensive tackle who gets after the quarterback. Um, there aren't a lot of guys like him. There aren't a lot of guys who produce like him. There aren't a lot of guys that impact the game like him from the defensive tackle position. But Bentley, Green, Danielson haven't produced a ton in their careers. Now, it's not necessarily a productive position. It's not necessarily a position where you're expecting to get nine sacks or seven sacks, or four sacks. You know, it's not necessarily a position where you're expecting to get double-digit tackles for loss. Kalijah Kansi is the exception. Aaron Donald was the exception. Mick Williams was an exception. Jalen Twyman was an exception. Pitts had a hell of a run with those kinds of guys, but they are exceptions. So you don't necessarily hold the lack of productivity against Bentley, Green, and Danielson, but if there's someone else who can produce, if there's someone else who can come in and, and get after the quarterback and make plays in the backfield, then you're going to bump those guys up. You're going to bump that guy up above a Bentley or a Green or a Danielson. And Elliot Donald might be that guy. Bam Brema might be that guy. is a guy who switches back and forth between defensive end and defensive tackle. He's a couple years older than Elliot Donald. He might have an opportunity to crack into that D-tackle rotation. But Elliot Donald, I think, ha- has, has an opportunity. DeAndre Jules be in the mix there, too. I think you have four veteran guys, but let's say this differently. You have Kalijah Kansi. All right, Kansi is in there no matter what. He's a starter. He's going to play the most reps. He's going to be on the field all the time. You have Kalijah Kansi. You're looking for three others to fill out that two deep rotation. You've got three veteran guys, three redshirt seniors in Tyler Bentley, David Green, Devin Danielson. I do not think those guys are locked into two deep spots. I think they could get pushed by Bam Brema, by DeAndre Jules by uh you know even potentially by Elliot Donald. You know, I think there will very much be competition there not just through the month of August but throughout the season. And I think mid October you could see, oh, now all of a sudden DeAndre Jules is getting a bunch of snaps or all of a sudden Bam Brema is getting a bunch of snaps or all of a sudden Elliot Donald is getting a bunch of snaps because through the course of practice in the season they keep getting better and showing the coaches that they deserve to get on the field more. So I think you could absolutely see that um, it's going to just be up to, it's going to come down to whether, what Donald can do in practice. I think it's going to be tougher than, for Nakai Johnson. I, I mean, I think those four DNs ahead of him are just so good that, you know, it's going to be tough to crack that rotation, but we'll see if, if he's good enough to, uh, earn it, then, then he will. TRR says, what's the first scrimmage date? It's pretty big to see who gets a leg up on the quarterback spot. I you know, I don't know for sure. I would assume they're having a scrimmage on Saturday. That typically is what they do. They might wait a week and only have one or two full scrimmages. As far as getting a leg up um, on the quarterback spot, like Keaton Slovis is going to win the job. Keaton Slovis is going to win the job. 
I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I don't think they're just pretending about the competition. I think they, they're giving Nick Patty every opportunity to win the job. I think they gave Nick Patty every opportunity to win the job in the spring. I think Nick Patty, you know, has a lot of respect from the players and from the coaches. I, I think everybody loves Nick Patty. But Keaton Slovis is going to win the job. When the time comes that Pat Narduzzi names a starting quarterback, it will be Keaton Slovis. And so I don't know if there's getting a leg up on the quarterback spot. It's just a matter of when the announcement gets made. That's my take on the situation. Uh, Zach Drager says, has anyone stood out so far in camp that hasn't been talked about um, or isn't on the radar so far? Um, That's a good question. I, you know, it, it's tough because I feel like we've talked about every guy. <laughs> I feel like we've talked about every scholarship player so far. I, I will say, probably a guy, and Jim Hammett pointed this out in his uh, training camp report um, on Wednesday. I will say that we probably need to give Blake Zabovic a little more consideration as a, as a potential competitor for that starting right guard job. I think the assumption has been that with Jake Cradle coming back from injury, he's going to just step right back in there, and they'll have their starting five. They'll just run it back with with Warren, Miner, Drexel, Cradle, Hoy. But I don't know. I don't know if that's set in stone just yet. I'm not even sure if it's penciled in. Yeah, Warren and Miner, yes. Drexel probably. Hoy, I think so. Right guard though. I I think there is a real competition there. I think Blake Zabovic's got a real shot at pushing Jake Cradle for that job and potentially winning it from him. So he's probably a guy that, that we haven't talked as much about. Um, Carter Johnson, I, I'm, I'm really interested there. Talking to Tim Salem, the tight ends coach, talking to Gavin Bartholomew, the freshman All-American tight end. Uh, they both really praise Carter Johnson, not just for you know his abilities or anything like that, although if you recall, he's the guy who... Went to TCU as a defensive tackle. was 330 pounds, and he's down to 255 now. He was down to like 220 at one point. And this is all in the last like two years. Um, so he's drastically changed his body to become a tight end uh, and probably a versatile tight end, H-back, fullback type of tight end, slot, that kind of receiving weapon. Um, but Bartholomew and Salem both praised him for how quickly he's picked up the offense. Bartholomew in particular was really impressed that, that uh, Carter Johnson seemed to have really picked up the offense really quickly. Uh, and so he's probably another guy to keep an eye on. But I, I guess I would point to them. I would point to Zabovic in particular. And again, it's only been a couple days of practice. So we'll see. You know, Ask me again next Wednesday night. Let's see here. Uh, Brock McDonick says, do you expect Jeremiah Anglin to announce his college destination to Pitt on Saturday? If I recall, you were fairly confident Pitt would get both Jesse Anderson and Anglin, but I believe you also said you were to believe Anglin would decide in a school early in July and Pitt was his only visit. Yeah, um, it looks like Anglin, Jeremiah Anglin, let me um just bring up his details here so I don't misspeak. He's a defensive back prospect who visited Pitt in the month of June. He's from Florida. And yeah, I believe Pitt was his only official visit, uh, but it sort of seems, I mean, my indication is that he's probably going to end up in Kentucky. UCF could be a possibility as well, um, but I think he's probably going to be a Kentucky guy. They've got, how many defensive backs do they have now? They have Jesse Anderson, they have uh, Shadarian Henderson, Harrison. Excuse me. They have Bryce Pollock, so they have three defensive backs. They had Shelton Lewis, but they lost him. Um, you know, I, I think they're good with three defensive backs right now, and they'll take a fourth if they have the right guy. If the right guy comes available, um, they'll take a fourth. But I, I don't. I think they would take Anglin. I don't think they're going to get him though. Uh, Vincent Calfo says, does A.J. Woods or M.J. Devonshire start opposite Marquez Williams, and who would be the fourth corner? I don't know who's going to start there. I, I think it'll be AJ Woods. Um not based on too much, but I, I think it'll be him. I they'll both play a lot. They both played a lot last year. I think Woods and Devonshire each played about four hundred snaps on defense last year, four hundred plus. So they've both been out there a ton. Um, you know, working behind Damari Mathis and Marquez Williams. 
so Williams would be a starter. I think it'll probably be Woods, maybe Devonshire at the other spot. And then, like you say, who would be the fourth corner? Vincent, I, I think that's as interesting a question as anything. Because you're going to have a battle there. I wish I hadn't said that. You're going to have a competition there with Rashad Battle, <laughs> Javante Royal, uh, you know, maybe a, a Tamarian Crumpley, maybe a, a, you know, a Noah Bigelow, maybe a Ryan, Ryland Gandy. There's a bunch of guys vying for that fourth cornerback spot. And it's going to be interesting to see who wins it. I'm not sure who's going to win it. I, I don't know even who would be the favorites at this point. But you are going to have four guys who all play a lot. You are going to have four guys um, who rotate heavily. And, and I think that'll be good. I think they have really good players in that um, in that group. Let's see, Mark Thurkle, super chatter. We really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for jumping in. Mark says, will Frank Signetti call plays from the field or in the box? Um, I believe he's always been in the box. I believe that's always been his um, his uh, preference is to call plays from upstairs, not be down on the field. So I assume he's going to continue doing that. Uh, so, yeah, he'll, he'll be up there. I think Mark Whipple was on the sidelines, right? Uh, Matt Canada was upstairs. I think Jim Chaney was on the sidelines. I think i mean it's all it's all preference you know it's it's personal preference the head coach will have some input on it but i think pat narduzzi is willing to let his offensive coordinators do what they want to do if they want to call it from the field call it from the field if you want to go up in the box go up in the box matt p says do you see them trying to use che wabuko as a returner from the jump if his hands are reliable enough you think they'd like to keep izzy abanacanda exclusive to running back if they can find someone as dangerous yeah you know so to be interesting with wabuko would they use him for more than four games and burn his red shirt just on returns? Or would they want to have a role for him on offense in addition to the return duties just to get something out of it, you know, to, to make it worthwhile? I don't, I don't know what the answer is there. I'm really not sure what they'll do with him. I don't think they'll burn his red shirt just to be a kick returner or maybe a punt returner. I don't think they'll put a freshman back as the punt returner. Um, I think they'll try to stay away from that. I don't know who the option would be then. Maybe Jalen Barden. Um, you know, kick returner maybe. But do you burn a guy's red shirt just to be a kick returner? Because, again, if he's not going to crack into that top five at receiver and get meaningful snaps there, then I'm not sure you would burn his red shirt just to, you know, just to return kicks. I, I like the speed. Look, I'm, I'm with you. I'm a big fan. I've, I've always been a big believer that you just put your fastest guys back there on kick return in particular. So, you know, you need to have a good plan for what the blocking is going to look like. And you need to have guys out there you can rely on to execute the blocking scheme on the kick return. And then you need a guy who's as fast as possible so that when the blocking is executed, he can not only follow it, hit the hole, but go and nobody is going to catch him. So I'm all about putting your fastest guys out there. And Wabuko will probably be one of the fastest guys on the team, if not the fastest. Uh, but I don't know if it's worth burning a red shirt, you know, playing in more than four games just to be the kick returner. Royce Beacom says, I can't subdue my concerns with the linebackers. Is the loss of Cam Bright second only to the loss of Jordan Addison? Is it a close second? Was that reflective of a cultural issue or a personal issue? Um, I mean, in terms of personnel losses, Kenny Pickett was the biggest. You know, Kenny Pickett was the biggest personnel loss. Jordan Addison was right there. Cam Bright, probably, right behind them. Um, what happened with Cam Bright? I mean, I think everybody saw the Peach Bowl and saw what happened on the sidelines of the Peach Bowl. And and I think when something like that happens, and, and it seems like there was even more to it than just that one incident, it seems like a tough situation to come back from. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you on the outside linebackers, Royce. Uh, obviously, Servasia Dennis is is really good, and he's going to be really good again this year. I look forward to to seeing what he does, and he can play middle linebacker, and he can um, you know he can get out and play outside linebacker if he needs to. If they have someone, you know, if Brandon George steps up at middle linebacker, and uh, you know that that could give Dennis an opportunity to move outside. You know that might be something that happens, and and then you you know you shore up one of those outside linebacker positions with you know your best linebacker. I'm I'm optimistic about those second year guy or third year guys, I guess, in in Kamara and DeShields. 
I think Shane Simon looks like a really good addition from Notre Dame. Tyler Wiltz, I'm pretty intrigued by to see what he can do. Uh, you know, they've rebuilt the depth with the transfers with Tyler Wiltz and Shane Simon. Um, they they got I think you know DeShields and Kamara both had big springs, and the coaches were really pleased with how they did during spring camp. Uh, it's just a you know a matter of inexperience. You know, Shane Simon has played a decent amount at Notre Dame, but wasn't really all that productive. Tyler Wiltz has produced a bajillion tackles, but he did it at Missouri State. Um, DeShields and Kamara haven't really played that much. So you've got this proven thing at Servassier Dennis, and then a lot of guys who are really intriguing and seem to have a lot of potential, but you don't know. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't know. And so I, I totally understand your concerns there, Royce. I, I think you're, you're, you're right on with having those concerns. Um, my irrational optimism about Kamara and DeShields makes me a little less concerned about it, but I don't think you're off base at all. Uh, Matt P points out Andy Isabella. I was trying to think of the UMass quarterback or the UMass receiver from a few years ago who got a bajillion targets uh, with Mark Whipple calling the shots. Andy Isabella, that was the guy. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Nathan Falchetti says, thoughts on when they'll wear the alternate gray jerseys, if at all, praying it's not for the backyard brawl. It would be a huge screw up to wear any kind of alternate jersey for the season opening game on Thursday, September 1st, primetime. You have the premier game in college football. You have the eyes of the college football world upon you. I know other teams are playing. Nobody cares about those games. This is the backyard brawl. This is Pitt and West Virginia. The rest of the country is going to be watching this game. And if you come out wearing anything other than your home uniforms, that would be a poor decision. I was trying to think of exactly how strongly I wanted to say that. It would be a very poor decision. You you need to look like Pitt. I, I, you, should, you know what? If you want to come out in anything other than your regular home uniforms, come out in those retro uniforms that you wore in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Wear those and actually look like Pitt. Look like a million bucks. You will look incredible if you bust those out on Thursday, September 1st. But they won't. They'll wear their regular home uniforms, which is what they should wear. That would make the most sense. If they're not going to go with those retros from 16 to 18, then just wear your regular home uniforms, look like Pitt. Everybody in the country is going to be watching. You don't need to dress up in any kind of goofy outfits. You don't need the grays. You don't need all whites. You don't need all yellows. You don't look like a highlighter. Okay? You saw what happened when Pitt played West Virginia, and West Virginia looked like a bunch of highlighters. Don't make that mistake. Okay? Don't do it. Just wear your regular uniforms. Um, Dave Yark says pit football doesn't seem to have many weaknesses and should have a more balanced or should be a more balanced offensive team. But in my opinion, the offensive line is key to having a super year. Also, how did the alum, alumni hoop game look? Well, I didn't watch the alumni hoop game. It seems like it was pretty cool. Um, I didn't get a chance to go down and check it out, but it's cool to see those guys being back around the program. Sam Young and Dewan Blair and LeVance Fields. All those guys that we all watched 20 years ago play really good basketball pit 15 years ago um, and, and really form the foundation of what pit basketball you know is in the 21st century or has been or is trying to get back to. Um, that's very, very cool. I didn't get a chance to go check it out, but I'm sure it was a lot of fun. Uh Dave says, in his opinion, the offensive line is key to having a super year. There's no question about it because the quarterback is the key to having a super year, and you got to block for him. They blocked really well for Kenny Pickett. They need to block even better for Keaton Slovis. Will Z says, I'm not too sure I hate the idea of Jake Cradle taking Owen Drexel's job and Blake Zabovic taking Cradle's space. If anything, it would add push to the line, especially in the run blocking. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and that could be, too. You know, I brought up Blake Zabovic as a guy that, you know, you keep an eye on in the battle for right guard. Maybe it's sort of a three-man competition for those two spots of right guard and center. Owen Drexel was fine last year, but you might have an opportunity to upgrade there with either Cradle or Zabovic. Zabovic has played, has played center, too. You know, maybe one of those three guys, or among those three guys, you should be able to find your center and your right guard. And whether it's last year's standard group that started the season of Drexel and Cradle, whether it's Zabovic and Cradle, Cradle and Zabovic, whatever it is, um, or or Drexel and, and Zabovic, whatever combination you come up with, 
Um, I, I do think that's probably on the table. I do think there is some competition that's going on there. I, I phrased it as just being a competition for right guard, but you might be right, Will. Competition for center and right guard um, could be could be happening here. Uh, Anthony Tennyson says, how about Khalil Anderson? Uh, it doesn't seem to be a lot of talk about him. He was really good coming out of high school. Yeah, um, Khalil, I, I talked a lot about him coming out of high school. I thought he was going to be a stud when he got to Pitt. I thought he'd play as a freshman. I thought he'd be in the cornerback rotation and uh, would get on the field. He didn't really play hardly at all. He only played like one or two games last year. And this uh, offseason, they moved him to safety. So he's playing, I think he's playing the, the field safety, the free safety position that Eric Hallett is in now. Tamar Hamlin played that spot. Jordan Whitehead eventually moved to that role. It's 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 a key position. It's it's really the 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 tent post of the uh, um, of the defense. You know, quarterback of the defense type of thing. Maybe even more so than the middle linebacker. And um, you know, I I think that can be a good role for Khalil Anderson. It's a position where converted cornerbacks have excelled like Whitehead, like Hamlin, like Hallett. Uh, and so I think Khalil Anderson can do well there. He's just going to have to wait behind Eric Hallett for another year. Now, maybe he can be in the rotation. Maybe he can be the backup. You know, he could be the number two field safety. Uh, but I don't think he's going to overtake Hallett. But I would expect to see him get more playing time this year, uh, working in the defense, maybe in a number of roles. But, you know, I don't think he's going to step into the starting lineup. I, I think there's still a lot of optimism about him. I think people, I think the coaches still feel pretty uh, high on his future and his potential. The Panther Room says, do you think Rodney Hammond will have a bigger role this year and Daniel Carter step up and be the fourth quarter running back guy this year? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to work the running back rotation. None of it made sense last year. I don't know if Andre Powell has a better plan this year. I think he is really concerned about guys getting hurt. And so I think that's why he tried to use as much of his rotation as he could last year. I think it's why he tried to mix in guys as much as he could to sort of preserve their health. If it's me, I'm, I'm riding Izzy Abanacanda as the number one. And then I'm figuring it out after that. You know, and, and so maybe Daniel Carter's closing out games. Maybe Rodney Hammond's closing out games in the fourth quarter. Maybe Izzy Abanacanda is closing out games in the fourth quarter. I think any of those options are good options. Uh, but I'm, I'm going with the Banacanda first. All right. That's, I, I, I don't know what the rotation is going to look like. I'm sure Andre Powell is going to send in different guys at different times and he's probably going to frustrate us all at different points. But to me, it's, it's Izzy and then situational. You know what I mean? There are good situations for Rodney Hammond. There are good situations for Vincent Davis and there are good situations for Daniel Carter. So mix and match as you see fit. Just make sure that Izzy Abanacanda is your number one guy. All right. It's just about 9.30. It's been a lot of fun tonight, as always. Make sure, look, if you want to continue these kinds of conversations and talking about these topics, the message boards at pantherlair.com are the place that you can do it. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. It's the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet. Football, basketball, recruiting. You can find it all at pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. And then, of course, uh, you know, make sure you do the things we need you to do here on YouTube. Like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Uh, we try and put a lot of video content out there. We're going to have a lot of video content through the month of August and into the season. We have our live streams either on Wednesday nights or after games or whenever anything big happens, we go live. You want to make sure you don't miss a live stream, subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom. You will never miss anything we do, any of the videos we post or any of the times we go live. Like this video too. That helps us uh, spread the word. So like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and check out pantherlair.com. Hey, go to pantherlair.com, sign up now. You only have until August 6th. So what day is that? Four, five, six. That's like Saturday. Saturday is the last day you can do this. Sign up with the promo code KICKOFF2022. One word, KICKOFF2022. You get the month of August for free on pantherlair.com. Free pit coverage throughout training camp. You ask anybody, that's the place. If there's one month of the year that you want to be on pantherlair.com, it's August. And we're giving it to you for free. A free trial for the month of August. pantherlair.com, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Sign up with the promo code KICKOFF2022. 
One, all one word, no spaces. Kickoff 2022. One big long thing. Do it. We'd uh, love to see you on the message boards. Thanks again for tuning in tonight. It's been a lot of fun on the live stream. Thanks everybody who watches later in the week. We appreciate that as well. Have a great rest of the week. We'll have the training camp coverage coming on PantherLair.com. Have a great weekend after that. We'll talk to you again next week.